And now I would like to go to somebody who is currently a member of the European Parliament and a very, very influential, experienced and influential member of the European Parliament from Austria, who is the chair of the group of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats, Mr. Hannes Svoboda. Um, I know that you are not running for election this time, but you, I know that you will continue very much to, uh, to work for the cause of Europe. And in fact, I want to introduce you rather through something which is, we already, uh, Dr. Busek mentioned, the initiative A Soul for Europe. Indeed, c'était Donner une âme à l'Europe. C'était des paroles de Jacques Delors. Uh, the slide, please, A Soul for Europe. And I have met Mr. Hannes Svoboda several times, in fact, in Berlin, because it started 10 years ago in 2004 uh, and every two years important uh, meetings were there and it was an initiative of the parliamentarians feeling that they need to encourage a stronger dialogue with the world of culture with the artists with the scientists and that's why this initiative and I think Mr. Svoboda you have been from day one involved uh, in that initiative the last was one two days after the new narrative for Europe event in Berlin a soul for Europe and believe it or not we had there all the candidates candidates of the European political parties for the post of the president of the European Commission were there dialoguing with the people um, of, um, from the cultural world and all of them made promises to make, to give culture stronger priority if they are going to become the president of the European Commission. So let us hope that they will live up to these promises. But uh, Mr. Svoboda, I would like to ask you one difficult question probably difficult, but you will have an answer. Why is it so that in spite of all those years that we have been mobilizing uh, the cultural world to discuss with a uh, leading figure in Europe about culture, why is it so that currently in the election programs of European political parties, none of them mentions culture? How come? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. How come? Yeah, you are right with your criticism. But I want to tell you a small story. I was uh, in Calabria two weeks ago, and our friends uh, from Austria invited other friends from Italy, more from the central part. And they said to Calabria, no, we don't go to Calabria. What do you see in Calabria? Nothing. So if even, and that's not only for Italy, you can have uh, for other countries as well, even have people from the center, and there were, the one was a doctor, there, there were some educated people, from the center of Italy to say to Calabria, I don't go because there's nothing to see there. But if you are in Calabria, you can see a lot of things from uh, the Hellenistic period, the Romans, the Spanish, the French, there are a lot of things to see. But that is connection with what you said about history. Because we don't learn history anymore in the, in the broader sense, or less and less, and that includes also politicians. I hope that you will have, uh, make a difference uh, like others, because um, if you don't see the historical development of Europe with its different cultures, which is different influences, then you, don't, you forget about the, the value of culture and forget about the value of the heritage. Second reason, of course, is the economic crisis. If you think all the time about economics and about a job or not a job and about the social elements, you forget about culture. If you cut a lot of expenditures, for example, in Italy, look at you know, the different reports about uh, Ecolineum or all the other places and how difficult it is to keep up the heritage. We saw today the seven uh, worst examples so which were chosen. By the way, on Monday I go to, uh, to the area there in Romania. We meet also the Romanian Prime Minister. We'll tell him of the honor. And it may be an honor to have chosen one of the uh, seven uh, places as, uh, as something which has to be more attention has to be given to it and more help. And if international European attention is given to the wooden churches in this area, then it is good for Romania. So you have to see it as a positive element and not, as you said, as a criticism. I think um, this is the second reason, this concentration. And thirdly, perhaps we did not argue enough about the economic impact and effect of our heritage, not only by restoring some of the places, but of course also tourism. Uh, going back to Calabria, all the old industries, steel and whatever, collapsed. 
But it is a beautiful area. It's, it's beautiful from the landscape, but it has a lot of, of things to show of our cultural heritage. So there's for some reason, for some region, uh, soft tourism, hopefully, is the chance also of economic recovery, together with cultural activities, with music, and many other activities. So I think uh, you're right. Uh, we have a, to do a lot in order to bring our, our heritage, but our heritage is also our future. <laughs> because uh, very ha happy to see that Doroteum, which is more about the, the old things to sell to new, uh, also new art and modern art, because you cannot, you cannot uh, disconnect the two elements. So I think there's a lot of, of things to do if you come to the European Parliament. Uh, I think we, ho hopefully many of us who uh, are no longer, will work on helping the young parliamentarians, not telling them what they have to do, but helping to implement the things they want to do. Because, and the, this is my last point, it must not be a compartmentalization. That is, culture for the culture people and the culture committee, and so no. Culture is something for the culture committee, but for the economics committee as well, for the social and tourism uh, committee as well. Only then we can really bring forward culture as a central element of European unification. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Svoboda, uh, insisting on this transversal value and, uh, of heritage and importance for all sorts of policies within the European Union. And I can tell you that we had a discussion uh, yesterday uh, in the Council of Europa Nostra, and we have been discussing that, and we also had the representative of the European Commission, Mr. Manier, there. We, our uh, members were definitely asking for more recognition of that transversal uh, value. And I have here, in fact, an interview that you have given to, I think, one of the uh, a Belgian newspapers, and there was a very interesting end question say, saying, um, what are you going to do afterwards um, um, now that you're going to stop to be a, a member of the European Parliament? And I thought this is a wonderful answer. I will be working with NGOs and private foundations. So we very much hope, Mr. Svoboda, uh, uh, so that we, as an NGO organization, we could perhaps also count on your advice, a cartoon of the famous cartoonist Plantu. And what does he say, Plantu? En attendant les élections européennes, waiting for the European elections, somebody say, Mais enfin, les amis, l'Europe, c'est la paix depuis 1945. Uh, it is the peace since 45. C'est un projet politique à inventer, a political project to invent. C'est une passion culturelle. It is a cultural passion. And the others are looking to him, say, what is he talking? Dis donc, ton copain, il ne serait pas vaguement ukrainien. Uh, is he perhaps not in his blood Ukrainian if he talks with such uh, enthusiasm about Europe? I think this was such a, such a good, and in fact, he made it cartoon after Denis de Cagrelet and I had a, a good uh, meeting in Paris with Plantu. We thought that it was really encapsulated in this cartoon so much. But before I give the floor to our guest, our young, um, another young uh, member of the Albach Network, I want to give, I just want to ask you for a couple of minutes of silence. I want to show you something, because we all know that very, in, as we are here, in Odessa, there were people who died. And I want to share with you a moment, uh, uh, something which was a month ago filmed in a historic market in Odessa. I thought it was so moving and so fitting for this moment. And please, just four minutes for music.
Natalia Lukianets, you are a young European from Ukraine. You are currently studying, you are a lawyer, and uh, you are currently doing uh, continuing your education in Frankfurt and Oder, and, uh, and having a lot of connections through the Albach network with young Europeans um, uh, in, uh, throughout, throughout Europe. We are talking about the new narrative for Europe. We are talking about European values. What are the, what is for you, a young European from Ukraine in these difficult times? Uh, what is the role of culture that you think that has to play in uh, for the future of Europe and also for the peaceful future in your part of Europe? First of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me and for covering Ukrainian issue. It is very and very important for my country these days. And a couple of words to this video. Why is it so interesting and why is it so remarkable? You see Odessa. Odessa has been always considered to be a Russian city, just because it is Russian speaking, we have to admit this. But nevertheless, it obviously showed us that it wants to stay the part of Ukraine uh, because, despite, because it is uh, inhabited of uh, people from, of different nationalities. Not only Ukrainians live there, but also people uh, who are Russians, Jews, uh, Germans, Greeks, yes, Armenians. And what is, and I think that this is the advantage actually of Ukraine. It's not necessary that we have, to, it's not necessary to be uh, Ukrainian, to be monolith, so to say. Our advantage is in our diversity. Yes, we speak different languages, but still we live in one country and we call ourselves Ukrainians. And for us it is very important to deliver this, to deliver this thought that there are no two Ukraines. There is no civil war, just because for the civil war we need two parties. But in this case we have just one party, one party which wants to stay united despite being so diverse. Um, also, I would like to say that, um, I guess, a couple of words about young people and what was their impact uh, during these events which took part in Ukraine. Something about five, okay, something about five months ago, um, one could say about Ukrainian youth. What is Ukrainian youth? Okay, these are people who, if to compare to the elder generation, who are more educated just because they have access to internet, first of all. Um, to compare to the elder generation, they are less politically active, but they are, or I would say even so, they are politically active, but rather in their special way, poking on the keyboard and making s struggles in the internet. This was the image of Ukrainian youth. But then Maidan happened. And the result of Maidan was that every third, every third who died was of age 20 or a little bit more. And I just want to emphasize that one of the objectives of Maidan was namely Europe. People stood for Europe too. It was not only against oligarchs, Yanukovych, but people, we wanted, just, we wanted just to take part in creating common European future and not just to gaze through a little hole in a big wall which was erected by our government between Europe and our country. And, okay, a lot of things could be told about our young people that if to compare with other, European, our other Europeans from Western European countries, that they might not, not be, I don't know, that they don't speak that good English. Maybe they don't look that good, they are not so stylish. But what I know, that they are ready to die for the principles. This is the most powerful message and it proves once more that Ukraine belongs to Europe. And I saw the presentation 
about, uh, well, actually, we all saw about the seven objects which are endangered. And you know what I've noticed? When the slide came with churches from um, Transylvania, I was thinking, before it was announced that it is Transylvania, I was thinking, oh my God, it's Ukraine. It's Ukraine. Yes, but no, it's Transylvania. Then came a picture with churches from Serbia, and I was thinking, and this definitely has to be Ukraine, somewhere in the center of Ukraine. But no, it's Serbia. Or just come, come to Lviv or Lemberg, you might know it as Lemberg. It's indeed a small Vienna. Come to Chernovitz. It's a small Vienna as well. So for us, it is very important that you uh, keep in mind that Ukraine belongs, that Ukraine is not less European. And of course, I know, uh, and I would like to, uh, using the occasion to ask you for the support. I know that all of you uh, represent uh, your country. Each country has its own troubles. Recently, I was speaking to a gentleman from Great Britain, and we talked about uh, British problems with Cornwall, for example. <laughs> yes, or, I don't know, Cyprus, um, some problems in Balkan states. I do understand. I'm not asking for something uh, big. I'm not asking for grabbing weapons and going protecting Ukraine from, from Russia, yes, but I'm asking just to talk. Talk about us, don't forget, because for when people forget, they make things die. For us, it is very important that you... Europa Nostra, right. Europa Nostra. Europa, Europa is also Ukrainian, and we are yours. This is the most important message. And the last thing I would like to say about... Um, about the place where I study. I do my master's as, uh, as, uh, Mrs., uh, as Mrs. Mihalovic already mentioned. I do my master's in Frankfurt under order. And there, uh, and there I saw one of the most amazing things I have seen in my life. This was a small bridge, small bridge, just a bridge. But it is a border between two big European countries and namely Poland and Germany and something about how many years ago? Five years ago, I guess. There was a checkpoint over there, and people couldn't move free. But now, you just stand, you just stay and, st and look at this masterpiece. People moving free, without any rep tape, without any obstacles. And this is really miracle. And they have no fears of each other, because they realize that they share a common future, or co common, sorry, common history, common reality, and, a common, and future. common future. And I see how both folks already, I mean, Germans and Polish, benefit from this. So, yes, Europa Nostra, let's stay united and not forget about how it was mentioned also in the video. Let's feel the responsibility for each of us Europeans. Thank you. Natalia, thank you so much uh, for ce témoignage, uh, témoignage personnel. Et en fait, it, it is a wonderful, presque une déclaration d'amour à l'Europe, I would say. Uh, somebody quoted uh, Jacques Delors, who said, uh, on ne tombe pas amoureux du marché intérieur, you don't fall in love with the internal market, mais on peut tomber amoureux des valeurs européennes et de la culture européenne et du patrimoine européen. And uh, it is wonderful what, what you have said. And, um, and also stressing, I was so pleased to hear you saying, the diversity of our cultures is our richness. Because you said that, and I, saw, I heard myself 25 years ago in Yugoslavia saying the same, the diversity of our cultures 
was our richness and still is our richness, even if very, uh, very, very unfortunate things happen in the Balkans. So it is through culture, through dialogue, through these bridges, this small bridge that you were, wonderful story about the small bridge in the city where you're studying now, through all these small and big bridges that we are going to make between our various cultures and uh, having the, 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 the conscience, the, the, the awareness of our shared history and our shared past that in fact we are writing this new narrative uh, for, for Europe.